Hey guys, it's Mark Holfe here, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, jumping on for another edition of the Express Entry Live Q&A. Now, I'm not sure how many people I'm going to have tuning in live today for the simple reason that I'm actually broadcasting this over an hour late. My sincerest apologies. I was involved in some really, really cool meetings here with my local community in Lethbridge um, and our Lethbridge Immigration Partnership, which is all focused on helping um, new immigrants and newcomers to our community settle, integrate, and just become a part of our community and a part of our family. And there were representatives from the college and the university, from the settlement organizations, there were employers, there were new immigrants themselves, and it's just a wonderful group, and I will be sharing more information about that because there's over 70 immigration partnerships all across the country. And when people talk about Canada and they talk about the welcoming nature of our country, absolutely, because these groups are funded by the federal government, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, in order to help people who actually immigrate, integrate into Canada. So pretty super excited about that. Now, with that being said, I want to apologize sincerely to all of you out there who were waiting so patiently and probably thought this is not going to happen today. And in fairness, it's going to have to be a little bit abbreviated. Uh, the meeting took longer than I intended. And so because of that, we are uh, probably many of the people who were staying up late to watch it will miss out. So my sincerest apologies for that. But guys, I've got some good people that are going to be joining me and um, I'm excited about that. But in the short term, <laughs> the reality is it's still me doing a lot of this stuff. So thanks for your patience. Um, and as we work through here, um, as I add new people to Holthy Immigration Law, my new firm, I'm sure things are going to get better from a production standpoint. But I just want to show you guys over here. Take a look. All right, pretty awesome. So where am I broadcasting from? This one is probably not a difficult uh, request for you guys to figure out where I'm actually broadcasting from because um, it's pretty much one of the most recognizable um, icons, I guess if you will, in the whole country. When you think about um, this lovely country of the world, when I think of this country, this is what I think of. And I think it doesn't even, it's probably not even worth asking you guys to post in the comment section where I'm broadcasting from. All right. So while I'm doing that and I'm reviewing some of the initial comments that are coming in, make sure that you post where you're tuning in from. So we've got uh, Abhishek says, hello, Mark. Great background again. Yes, it is. Uh, Manjalal says, I love Canada. That's great. I do too. And Nishal says Egypt. Absolutely it is. Yes, the Pyramids of Giza. I'm going to slide over here. Woo! See these things right here? Oh, let's get the right arm. This one coming across here. <laughs> Those pyramids, I am super excited because March 18th, I'm, I'm heading there with my wife and we're going to spend a few days in Cairo. We're going to spend a few days in Giza and we're going to head down to Luxor and I'm super excited because I've never been there before. Then we're going to go down to Petra and then ultimately we're going to spend a little bit of time right around Jerusalem and uh, in Israel. So it's a trip we are so very very looking forward to and uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm onboarding some a lot of good people. Uh, Susan Wood is with me, my, the immigration lawyer who practices out of Edmonton. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a bunch of new people um, join the firm, which will allow me to do more of these videos and will allow, um, well, just to, to expand the office. All right. I'm working on my website. It's not quite there, but it's getting close. And so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to release the new website for Healthy Immigration Law. But as it stands right now, um, you'll see when you go there, there's just enough information for you to get there, to book your consult, to fill out the consultation form, and even to make payments. And so at this stage, you guys know where I'm at. You can find me. And uh, as the website, I don't want to launch just kind of a junky website. I want it to really, really um, be a site that tells people who I am, what I do, and what this whole the immigration law is all about. All right, so Gurjeet says, hi, Mark. Uh, finally, I'm back to India now from the UK. Great, Gurjeet. That's awesome. Um, uh, Chirima says, the background looks great. Thanks. It's so cool. 
And as always, I want to tell you guys, um, when you're tuning in, type where you're listening from. So put that in the comment section. And there's a few people that are piling on, even though I was so late. So my sincerest apologies for that. Um, yes, I was so late. I'm just trying to pull off a picture that I want to share with you guys. That is an awesome, awesome picture from two awesome young kids that are now officially immigrants of Canada. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, I think this should work now. Well, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to pull off pictures um, from my uh, Skype account. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. And I think I've officially figured it out. Okay, I think we're good now. Let's see. Okay, I want to share. I want to share something with you guys. There it is right there. I think you remember me telling the story last week of Igor and Tatiana and the fact that they had gone through quite a challenge. And if you haven't watched it, go back to the YouTube channel or search in the videos right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. And you will see um, that well, you'll be able to watch and listen to Igor's story. And Tatiana wasn't quite able to join us, but the reality is um, she was there in spirit. So I want to show you one of the coolest pictures. Check this out. All right, look at that right there. It's kind of covering my ugly face, but you guys can see it. There is two super happy people. Canada, that is the Calgary International Airport, and Igor and Tatiana officially arrived in Canada as the newest permanent residents of our country on Monday. And so I am super excited for them. Do you know what? I realize how much I say I'm excited. But it's true. I'll slide them over there. I am super excited. <laughs> and this time I really am because it was I know the journey they went through. And I once again, go back and watch it. It's a phenomenal story. And um, it just exemplifies why I do and practice immigration law. So congratulations to Igor and Tatiana, who are now the uh, some of the newest permanent residents of Canada, having officially landed on Monday in Calgary and are going to make my wonderful province of Alberta home. All right, guys, thanks so much. Uh, and we will drift them off here into the sunset. Okay, let's see where everybody else are, are listening from. So hopefully you've posted in the comments where you're tuning in from. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, Mahanad says, I hope March won't be too cold. Normally during March, Petra will be a bit cold. Welcome to Jordan. Mahanad, I can tell you that the weather is going to be perfect because right now, most of the winter here in Canada, well, on, on many days, it can be minus 15, minus 20. Some crazy days, it can be minus 30 degrees Celsius or colder. So if it's 15 degrees or 17 degrees, understand that is perfect for us. We love that weather. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Kush says, good afternoon, Mark. Okay. So guys, this is going to be a short abbreviated one. I just have a few questions that, I, that I'm going to um, answer that were sent in by listeners. And then once I've done that, then I'm going to jump and I'm going to answer any of your live questions that you have. Once again, I want to apologize for not being able to broadcast on the right time um, at noon, how we usually are, are, are doing these EE live Q and A's, but I was out of the office attending these meetings with the Lethbridge Immigration Partnership, which is a wonderful community organization, um, that supports newcomers to our wonderful city. And there are over 70 immigration partnerships like this all across the country that are funded by the, um, Immigration Refugees and Citizenship Canada that are all designed to help newcomers settle in their communities and be successful. And if you listen to Igor's video from last week, his interview with me, he talked about right from the get-go some of the things that are accessible to him and Tatiana to help them integrate when they come to Canada. And now they're benefiting from all of those things. So shout out to Canadian Immigration for all of the wonderful supports that they give people when they are successful in getting their um, EAPRs approved and they come and live in Canada. So big, massive shout out to them for that because the supports, I think, are unparalleled all over the world. I don't think newcomers to Canada are given as many uh, accesses to support and help to find success as we offer in Canada. But now I'm going to blast IRCC because I think they are also in the same light for applicants, cruel, heartless, and just brutally, brutally awful to people who make the slightest, tiniest mistakes. And normally I don't like to lambaste immigration too much because I have meetings with them every six months. 
But I think this one touch policy with immigration when it comes to express entry is just it's just unfair. And sometimes the officers just truly don't care. And if you believe somehow that you as an applicant, that the immigration officers care about you, you are sadly mistaken because they don't. They only have to answer to the government, to the immigration minister, and to the levels planning and targets that they're supposed to answer to. So you as a foreign national have no rights, you've got no privileges. Ultimately, if you can show them that you meet all of the requirements with 100% degree of accuracy, then in those circumstances, you can get your application approved. And then the full weight of Canada's love and welcoming is there. But if you are an individual who's made a mistake on your application or submitted something that was incorrect, even if it was innocent, you are in rough shape. And understand that if your application gets returned for even the slightest reason, the likelihood of them reconsidering it if you correct the mistake is almost non-existent. And um, this is where I'm going to really criticize the government because I think the one-touch policy when it comes to express entry is so cruel and unfair. And I'm going to advocate for as long as I'm on the Canadian Bar Association um, to the government <clears throat> that they need to soften their position. Because to, as some of my clients recently experienced, they uploaded a, birth, uh, a marriage certificate from one of the states in the U.S. And that marriage certificate was what appeared to be an official marriage certificate, but they didn't realize and didn't know that that marriage certificate wasn't the official state uh, certificate from that state. They weren't from the U.S. They got married in the U.S. And it was instead from their, um, from their pastor, from the congregation uh, that where they were married in a religious ceremony. It had a seal. It looked every, like it was 100% accurate. And they did everything else perfectly correct. They got their ITA. They followed all the instructions. Unbeknownst to them, there was this other civil certificate. And they just did not appreciate the distinction. And because of that, their application gets returned. And we're fighting. We're trying to correct it. We're trying to see if immigration will, will take a consideration, you know, will, will take it into consideration the fact that they truly thought they had done everything correctly. Um, but we just don't know. And in the case of that couple, yes, they could get back immediately into the pool, which they've done. But when people have birthdays, then they lose five points. And so for that simple little thing, their possibility of immigrating to Canada could be gone. And it just it just tears my heart out. I'll be honest. It's just it's unfair. It's cruel and it's heartless. And I think that's exactly what the policy is. Sure. If someone misses something that they should have done. For example, I'll give you another example. Um, in my previous firm, my assistant accidentally checked off both boxes on the use of representative form. One was for um, what type of a representative you are, and they accidentally checked off the, the, uh, the checkbox for Quebec, as well as the other provinces, and indicated my information. And so the officer returned the whole package because the use of representative form was incorrect, and then they wasted about two or three weeks trying to send it back to my client's residential address, which they do not take mail because they're on one of the, um, the First Nations reserves here in Canada. And I don't know if it was just designed to embarrass me or something. And without a doubt, it was a mistake. My, and I didn't catch it. It was totally on me. But those are the kind of things that the government does now. They return things when there is just the slightest thing that isn't right. But in this case, the, the amount of time and energy that they wasted instead of just returning it to my office um, is just astounding. But that's the way they run the policies. And all that we can do is try to be exactly correct, 100% honest, genuine, and just try to do the right thing. So I wanted to just take a few minutes just to rant a little bit because um, I think it's just unfair. So you guys who think you're so smart and you can get your application done on your own and that you don't need assistance from anyone else because the government says it's super easy, you, you better beware. Because if you miss anything, if you think you've got it right and you miss even the slightest thing, they will crucify you. They, and what does it mean by that? Well, I don't want to be a fear monger or someone who's making something more of something than it really is. But understand, when your application is returned in express entry, especially for all of you who are overseas, 472 is so high. 
And if you are so fortunate to get it at 472, it may never come back down to that level again. It may not. And in the case of, uh, of my clients, it's possible that after, you know, a birthday could come and they could lose five points before the next draw. And you know what it's like. You, you drop those points. It could be that could be your opportunity to come to Canada. So I'm, I'm done kind of. <laughs> I'm going to stop complaining here. I've said my piece and I hope immigration watches this video. But I'll tell you, I'm so very, very disgusted with the whole process. And I understand the importance of efficiency. I understand it. But people's lives are being destroyed. And as far as I'm concerned, and they really are, when they've sunk all of their effort, all of their planning, everything into immigrating to Canada, and because of some little tiny oversight, they lose out. I just, I don't know. I just think it's cruel. I think there's a better balance. I think there's ways that you can, you, you should be able to realistically reach out and request. And so, all right. There you go. So that's kind of where things are at. And those of you who are just tuning in late, if you want to listen to Mark rant about the cruelty of immigration, uh, Canadian immigration, um, you can just go back and this will be this video will be broadcast on uh, the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel, or you can watch it as a recording here. And I I do want to finish off with just giving a big shout out to immigration. Once people get their EAPR and they get their their confirmation of permanent residence. There are a ton of wonderful supports out there to help them integrate. So yes, I, I'm unbelievably upset with their with their one-touch policy and the cruelty of it and the effect it has on families. But I also want to give them a shout out where credit is due. And when it comes to settlement, the, the resources and the welcoming nature of Canada is unparalleled in the world. So there you go. Good and bad. I'm just really angry right now. Okay. Okay. So going forward, um, I have just a couple questions that were sent in by listeners. And if you, let's see if I can find it here. If you are interested in sending me a question that you would like answered, I've got to delete a whole bunch of these. I've got so many there. Here's how you do it. You send an email to info at wholefeelaw.com and my intake specialist, Mauricia, will, um, filter your question and if your question is a question that would benefit all of the other listeners here then in those circumstances it will likely get through for me to answer live for those of you and remember when you send the email you must put ee live q a in the subject line because that will tell mauricia that that is a question that you would like directed to the ee live q a if not then um, she will probably send you a request for a paid consultation and the paid consultations are via my law firm website which right now I just have a very, very little, you can see right here, I have a very, very little uh, bit of information on here, but the most important part is scheduling a consult. Now, I just went through the first draft uh, with my web developers who I always plug those guys as well, and that's Parrot Solutions right here. We can pull them up. So they are helping to develop the site and we just went through the first version of it. And I should almost beta test it with you guys. I should almost pull it out and say, hey, what do you like? What do you think? Right now, I'm trying to figure out photographs and imaging. But Parrot, they've been right beside me all the way through. And they've been just great supporting me. Okay, so that site, stay tuned. It's going to be coming shortly. Okay, so back to what I was saying before. If you have a question, you send it in. When you send it in right here, EE Live Q&A will give you consideration to be included. So we'll get rid of that, and then I'm going to answer the first uh, couple questions that were sent in by listeners. And the first one here, um, this one is from uh, Mady, and Mady says, Dear Mark, hope you're doing good. I would ask a question for the next EE Live. While filling the PR application form, I came to one concern regarding my spouse's name. In my EE profile, I didn't pay attention to the explanation of how to fill in the name field. Uh-oh. Ah, attention to detail is everything, my friend. Hence, I put the spouse name for my spouse's name. Uh, I put my spouse name for my spouse name field. Uh, okay, not quite sure what that means. Indeed, the spouse name is indicated in her password as following. Okay, um, I am wondering if it would be a concern for the immigration officer if I corrected it in the PR application form by filling her native name as it is requested, which leads to a discrepancy between the EE profile and the PR application form, and knowing that both names are visible in my pa spouse's passport. Thank you for your time. Okay, so basically, Mady's saying that there was a problem with how he entered his name into the EAPR. 
and um, well, I should say into the profile first. And uh, when he got his ITA, now he's going through pulling up the passport and realizing that there's going to be, well, basically it's wrong. And he has to change it so it matches with the passport. So the simple answer maybe is yes, you can totally make that change now. Correct it. Uh, if you need to provide a little explanation in your letter of explanation, then do that. But there should be no issues making that change. For those of you who are wondering how do you do that, well, at the top of your, your field, when you are at your, um, your initial page, where it has, it's kind of like your landing page, I call it, uh, where you're filling in the information for your EAPR. At the top, you'll see a little link there that says modify uh, family information. And that's when you can go back in and modify and change that name through that process. Um, all right, so that's great. That's a great question, Mady. Okay, moving on, this one is Nazar. And Nazar says, hi, Mr. Mark. Thank you for your efforts. You are the <laughs> okay. Understand, guys. I don't screen these. This is Mauricio who's screening them. I'm not just picking out the ones that sound the best for me. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for your efforts. You are the best immigration lawyer. I would like to ask if it is required to show proof that my work experience was paid, and if yes, what kind of proof is acceptable? Actually, it is my previous job that I'm going to claim work experience for, and it was more than one year back. And the only proof I have is the bank statement showing my monthly salary, which I can't get from my bank because it is more than six months back. Thanks in advance. Okay, Nazar, let's take this opportunity to have a little quick teaching moment. All right, and then after Nazar, then I'll start answering everybody's questions that are live here. And our, our, the number of people that are attending live right now are not as high because I'm an hour late from when I should be doing this. And it's gonna be a, a little bit short. We're gonna have to cut it a little bit shorter because I have a, um, I actually have a consultation at two o'clock. So usually I give myself lots of time, but it just happens sometimes. And I wanted to do this regardless. I didn't want to miss a week. I really wanted to, to try to do it. So thanks for your patience, everyone. Okay, so let's go in and let's take a look right now at, I'm just gonna pull up uh, the page I'm looking for first here. And the question, all right, so I'll share my screen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the um, completeness check site. So completeness check IRCCEE works, or you can just type in in your computer, the applications for permanent residence program subject to the express entry completeness check. And then I am going to search for work experience. So I'm going to pull this up here and then you'll see this is what you need to provide. And you can see here the following documents are mandatory. So in the case here, if we flip back uh, and we go to uh, Mady here, you can see that Mady's question he said, basically, um, uh, let's see, actually, we're at the top one here. I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, okay, so you can see previous job that I'm going to claim work, ex work experience for, and it was more than one year back, and the only proof I have is the bank statement showing my monthly salary, which I can't get from my bank because it's been six months longer. So in this case, um, well, obviously, one thing, the first thing you're going to look at is can you get that reference letter from your employer? That's the first thing. And then if you go to your personal document checklist and click on that little information button, the little question mark, uh, by that section of your personal document checklist, it says that you need to provide this mandatory, you can see, reference letter or experience letter from the employer and pay stubs if available. So if you have them, you should include them. And if you work for a company that's a large multinational recognizable entity that can clearly confirm all of your work history and um, you know, even your profile on LinkedIn shows that you worked for the company, whatever it might be, if there's a lot of evidence for the officer to find, then they're not gonna get as hung up about pay and proving that you're actually working and that kind of stuff. They will still look for it, they will still expect it, but they'll give more reference and they'll give more credence to the actual reference letter because the reference letter must include this information, job title, duties and responsibilities, job status, if it's the current job, dates worked for the company, number of hours worked in the annual salary and benefits. So that's what you're trying to prove. And I won't get into all of the Federal Skilled Worker Program eligibility, but you can look it up if you want to and just type in FSWP eligibility and it will explain what's required to claim your foreign work experience. But in its essence, this, all of these components that we have here are all parts of those elements that an officer is looking for to actually be able to prove that you have the foreign work experience that you've claimed in your profile. And ultimately after the ITA, the invitation to apply, 
in your electronic application for permanent residence. So in the case of our friend right here, um, Nizar, so he's looking for proof. Now, the first question is, do you have to show that you've been paid? Well, I said, if you have pay stubs, then your obligation is to provide them. Do you have a reference letter? If you have that reference letter, great. If you don't, then that's where it becomes tricky and a challenge. That's where, um, you know, pay stubs, yes, help. If you had automatic deposits in your bank account, then you include those as well. But in the case, once again, of, um, of Nazar here, um, in Nazar's situation, if you don't have any of that, then you're just going to have a real hard time. And the reality is, if you are unable to prove your work experience based on what the government is looking for, what do you think, guys? And I'll, I'm going to flip back here. What do you guys think? If you're not able to demonstrate that, if you can't get a letter from your employer, you know, let's say the the employer, even the business is shut down. Well, guess what immigration's response is going to be to you when you say, look, I did really work in that occupation um, and I did work for that company, but they're closed and they paid me in cash and we just had an oral agreement for work. Guess how sympathetic immigration, refugees and citizenship Canada is going to be and in particular, the immigration officers adjudicating the express entry system, guess how sympathetic they are going to be to you. Guess. If I asked you to post comments, <laughs> hopefully every single one of you will say they will show no mercy. And so you have to go out of your way to try to find every way that you can to prove and establish your work history. The more evidence you can, the better because your object is to make sure that you give the government every single thing that they need within your EAPR and your document checklist to basically eliminate the officer's discretion down to nothing. Because you've given them everything, then the only option they have is to approve. So that's the only advice that I can give you at this stage, but you have to be creative, you have to think outside the box, and you have to do all that you can. Maybe you have coworkers that can sign you know, sworn statements. But understand, even all of those things, with the way the government is going now, if an officer doesn't feel like they've got time to sort through that, well, they're not going to give it a lot of attention and they'll just refuse your application and say, oh, you didn't provide what we needed. And guess what? Check! Their six-month processing times are held under check. And they can be very, very proud of themselves for processing the application quickly within the timelines and the service level standards that the government has said they have to meet. And so, in fairness, I do feel for the officers, and I don't want to throw them under the bus. They're just doing their job. Um, but I do, I do have an issue with the people that are making the decisions at the top that have removed a lot of the discretion away from the officers. And yes, it's expedient. It's fast. People who do get through are getting through in six months or less, or maybe a little bit more. But lightning, lightning fast speeds compared to the years when it could have been six or seven years. So... Very, very, you know, um, very impressive that they're able to do that. But sometimes I just wonder at the cost. I wonder at, at, at what they're sacrificing in, you know, in the process of doing this. Um, but I don't make those decisions. I just complain about them, right? <laughs> and offer my thoughts on it. So, all right, let's take a look at the questions that have been sent, uh, that you guys have been posting now. So now there's a few people here. Uh, that are watching live and now's the time to reward you guys for be your patience. So um, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to start um, and remember these questions are about express entry so I'm going to go back a little bit here and see where I can start. Um, okay so Sager says Hi Mark my file has been transferred to the local office in Etobicoke and it has been a total of 14 months I haven't heard anything from them. Sager that's an issue. Uh, my wife applied for PR to the PNP paper-based category, and I am dependent on the file. Okay, so as far as it being 14 months, um, that's fully within the processing timelines. So I'm not even concerned about that. Um, why they transferred the file? Well, it could be that they have more space, more, more officers that are available to adjudicate it. But understand the processing times right now, like let's go and take a look. And this is where I, 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 you know, I take some issue because understand, guys, you have to be reasonable in your expectations with processing. And the faster the processing times, the more cruel the decisions are going to be. So understand you get what you pay for. But if we go to the processing times right here, and we go to economic immigration, we click on provincial nominees. And in this case, uh, Sager's application was filed paper base. So no, it's not by express entry. And yes, I already applied. If we click on here, you'll see processing times are 18 months. 
So as far as 14 months, um, if that's the total processing segue, you're right on track. So there's no concerns or no issues at all. Um, uh, now he says here, um, uh, let's see, the other reason for which I think they transferred the file was uh, my open work permit was rejected because I did not pay the correct fees. Do you think it was such a big deal that they put my file to Tobacco and now they're just not working on it? Um, Sager, this is something, my friend, that you got to book a consult with me so we can go through this in detail. It's just not possible for me to answer that in the, this type of a, a form. Um, but there could be a whole host of number, re, you know, a whole host of reasons. But you can see 18 months is the current processing time. And that's too bad about the fees. Once again, guys, another example. It's simple, right? It's so simple. But by having a person, another uh, like, for example, me as your immigration lawyer collaborate, collaborating with you, um, working through the process together, these things don't get missed. Um, but when you do it yourself, or even when a lawyer in their office relies just on their paralegal to do everything, and they don't even review things closely, that's how things get missed. But my new firm, Healthy Immigration Law, I am going to transform the way immigration is done. And it is going to be far more collaborative it's going to be virtual like this, but everybody is going to work together and take ownership over the application. But my clients are the ones that will drive the ship forward. They're the ones that will retain control because that's what I found. You want to know where your application is at. And when you submit it yourself, you have control. So that's one of the models that I'm really, really championing, championing right now. Championing right now. And you'll see it as I explain it all on my new website because I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Okay, so now what I want to do is continue on. So we'll go to the next question. This is Michael. Welcome back, Michael. Another repeat follower. Um, hi, Mark. For CEC, should the primary knock reflect the actual job or can it be a previous job within Canada but not the same knock? Well, Michael, the, the, the um, previous job can be uh, a position that you're not currently working in. That's fine as long as that primary knock meets the minimum requirements of the Canadian Experience class. And when we go into our, here, our film, we flip it up, you can actually type in CEC eligibility, and we'll pull this up so everybody can see. I'll click on the link right here. And then if you look at the minimum requirements, essentially for this, the key is that you have at least one year in the last three years. And it's not continuous, it doesn't have to be continuous. It just needs to be full-time or a full-time equivalent, okay? And obviously you have to be legal in Canada. And so that's really what you're looking at. You have to make sure that you are meeting that initial one year. And then after you have that, then you've met the eligibility. So then you can claim work experience in other knocks. But for the purposes of the Canadian Experience class, that initial eligibility part, you have to have at least one year in that three years immediately before you apply. After that, then you can count work experience all the way back for 10 years if you were in Canada. All right. Okay, good question. Okay, this one is Ankit. And Ankit says, what if the employer don't agree to provide a reference letter in the expected format? Great question, Ankit. I get this a lot. Sometimes employers, especially the big IT companies, don't care about you. You're a number. You are a body that's producing a product for them, whether it's a, a software application, whether you're you know, doing some type of, um, um, you know, engineering on, on, in the IT world, whatever it is, you're doing a job for them and they don't want to support your permanent residence. They want to keep you locked into them. And in many other countries, it's the same situation. They just don't want to support you immigrating to Canada because then you'll leave them. So that happens a lot. So then in those circumstances, you have to do everything you can once again to try to collect and find all of these things right here in some other format. So if you can't get, and look, these are mandatory. So what that means is if you don't provide them, then guess what? <laughs> if you don't provide them, then what that means is um, immigration officer, if they're just all about efficiency, which apparently that's what they are right now, they don't even have to look at the other documentation you provide if they don't want to. Um, sure, you can appeal it, and sure, I can file a judicial review and say that it was unreasonable, their decision that whole nightmare of a process. And really that's the only remedy that we have these days. Um, but there's nothing stopping them from refusing it because it doesn't check off the box on their checkbox. Okay. So I just want you guys to understand that as we're going through this process, it is not an easy process. 
And if you can't find exactly what immigration is looking for, then in most cases, you are subject to getting your application refused. And there's not a lot of mercy. There really isn't. Okay. All right. So, um, Gurjeet says, my question is about the SIMP. Okay. I'm going to skip right through yours, Gurjeet, because we're just focusing on the express entry and not uh, the PNPs, because there's just too many aspects to the the, the um, various provincial nominee programs, and they're so specific and so unique um, that I, I I will create a special PNP as I get my firm set up. I'm going to start producing a ton more content. You think I've produced a lot now? You just wait and see. But uh, for your situation, Gurdit, I'm going to skip yours because we're just focusing on express entry today. Okay, um, and it looks like Anise is also simp. Uh, let's see, he's got some questions here. I have a question last time due to issue of simp misrepresentation banned for two years. Can we apply for a study permit? Okay, same thing, Anise. Um, there's consequences when there's misrepresentation. And if there's a something that they felt was not genuine or you misrepresented, in other words, you lied on your application, then the consequences are are big. And I think I answered this last um, in the last time that we, we met. Um, the information sharing is pretty broad between entities. And um, ultimately, the application that you submit to the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program is not a federal immigration program. So the officers may not have direct access to it. Um, it's not considered a, a visa refusal. And so you just have to be careful how you answer that. Okay. Okay. So Ankush, um, let's see. Could you please take this? Uh, I don't know what you're saying. Okay. Um, okay. Michael, I guess it's coming later. Okay. Michael says, thanks, Mark. Talk to you soon. You're very welcome, Michael. Uh, Ezra says, hi, Mark. Can you tell us your thoughts about why CRS scores are going up? Is there any chance to go down below 465? Ezra, I can tell you very clearly that the reason is because, to a large extent, the number of people that are now in Canada getting points for Canadian experience. In other words, they're getting points for having studied in Canada, either 15 or 30 points. They're getting points for getting post-grad work permits and having worked in Canada. You know, 35 or 40 points for the first year, 10 or more points year every year after. And so those points are what's setting them aside, uh, setting them apart from from a person that is trying to qualify with their own human capital points alone. That's when you're qualifying outside of Canada with no connection, just your language, your education, your work experience, your age, those individuals, uh, it's just, it's going to be harder and harder to qualify. And I feel for you guys because it's, the program is very quickly becoming a Canadian based program, which um, unless you're very, very elite with a master's degree, not much older than 30 years old, three years skilled work experience and English off the charts, really high IELTS scores, you're just not going to qualify. And do I think it's going down? No, I don't. It's impossible. With over 740,000 international students in Canada, now they're not all going to be seeking to become permanent residents. Many will go home, but many are. That's the whole reason they got, they came into Canada. They came to these stupid, useless um, private schools that don't offer any education that's worth anything. Um, they're solely designed as a study permit farm to take money from people to issue study permits and then allow them to get open work permits under the postgrad program. Those, those schools, I wish they were all shut down um, because a, a lot of students have come through those. But the good public reputable schools like the University of Lethbridge, Lethbridge College, those are just phenomenal institutions, great schools that I went to myself, University of Manitoba where I did my law degree. All of those are great schools, and when you get accepted to those schools, your education means something. But there's, like I said, 740,000 international students, probably climbing the numbers. Um, you know, I just in my in my Lethbridge Immigration Partnership, the government, uh, we we talked about some statistics and things like that, and and um, you know these statistics are available when you when you search through. But some countries have really high rates of refusal, and some African countries have refusals as high as 80% of applications who apply. And so they have to do something to curtail all the study permits that are being uh, that are being um, uh, issued. Because if these people are all planning on becoming permanent residents, well, it's, you know, and the government for years has highlighted the benefits of coming to study in Canada because then you'll have the ability to become a permanent resident. Well, those days are just about done. Um, if, if everybody's trying to compete and there's only a limited number of spots, you know, less than 100,000 that are earmarked towards express, and well, to the economic programs, um, guess what, guys? There's not going to be enough spots to fit. Okay, let's whip through these last ones really quick because my time is just about up here. Uh, um, 
Benayash, uh, Benayash says, sir, I worked for three year nonstop and then left. Later on, after a year, I came back to the company and worked for more than a year for the same duties. Is the four year work experience? Yeah, it could be if you're in Canada. As long as you've got a valid work permit, if you're outside of Canada, yeah, that works. You only have to show that you have enough continuous full-time work experience in the same NOC um, to meet the selection criteria, to meet that 67 points out of 100 under the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So when you're applying for Express Entry, the Federal Skilled Worker Program is genuine, uh, generally what you're qualifying through. And so your work experience has to be continuous full-time in the same NOC to be counted as work experience under the Federal Skilled Worker Program. But once you've met that threshold, if it only took you one year to get the 67 points out of 100, then you can use other knocks to claim the rest of your th two years of comprehensive ranking system points for foreign work experience to get those uh, skill transferability bonus points, those extra 25 points. Okay, um, uh, Ankush, is medical for PR work uh, visa any different? Yep. And Kush, a, a medical for a work permit is um, um, is excessive demand exempt, essentially. So it doesn't require you to, it, it's a different medical and it's based on different standards. Now, with the with the medicals that most of the doctors issue now, they usually all look the same. But uh, for the purposes of the assessment, there is actually a distinction between PR and work permits. And for permanent residents, you have to show that you're not going to create an excessive demand on Canadian health or social services, whereas for work permits, you don't. Okay, um, Gurjeet says, thanks, Mark. Sorry, Gurjeet. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer your question. Okay, um, what if some of the required information that should be included in the work experience are missing? Okay, well, this is, this is another example. Be prepared. This is why my clients book consoles with me all the time, is to figure out how to protect themselves as much as possible, how to brainstorm, how to think about all the possible ways to, to shore up and support deficiencies in the letter. But understand, if you... If the officer isn't satisfied and there is no fine line, right? Officers have discretion, then you could see your application refused. Okay. Um, Ankush says, can I use a work visa medical for PR2 if it's still valid? I'd get a new one. I would, just in case, Ankush, I would. Uh, Ralph says, hi. Hi, Ralph. <laughs> oh, you're not late, my friend. I was the one who was late. It's so good. I love your profile picture, Ralph, with, with little Jaden up above you. Oh, I I miss that little that little kid. Uh, I have to get back up there to see you guys. Uh, Ralph is a former client who lives up in Edmonton, and uh, he had his own unique story. And uh, maybe one day, Ralph, you'll be brave enough to come join me and tell talk about your story. If you want to learn more about um, Ralph and and his sister Bella and um, and her husband Kai and their crazy, challenging, difficult journey immigrating. Um, you can go back and watch a previous EE Live Q&A. Uh, maybe, Ralph, if you can find it, maybe you can even post that one uh, here in the comments. Okay, um, let's see here. Do you know what, guys? We are, oh, Bella, Bella. There she is. Bella's here, too. Love the, bra love the background. Thanks so much. Look at Bella's here, too. Hi, Mark. Awesome. They're both here. So cool. Okay, let me see if I can whip through quick Bernard, and then I have to get on the call in two minutes, and maybe they'll be Skyping in from, for the consult. Um, thanks so much for your help. Is it a problem if I downloaded a three-month average balance for proof of funds, not a six-month average? The guy at the bank did that by mistake, noticed it after I submitted my EAPR. Well, you guys know, it says that you need to provide a letter uh, stating the average balance for the last six months. Often with my clients, if they don't, if the bank won't produce that letter with the average balance, then I do provide bank statements. It's up to the officer. It's in their ballpark right now, and they can be cruel. I've seen it. They've been really cruel lately. It's probably because they have... A lot of files and they're starting to creep up above the six month processing some in some cases so they're probably just trying to flip it through and get it done quick um, okay uh, Jason says hi Mark how I hope you're fine how do we update our common law status back to single if we separate after getting an idea but before applying EE do we need to provide evidence yeah that's super complicated uh, Jason um, you're gonna need to provide something and uh, the, sometimes there just isn't anything right if you're common law and you've moved out um, I guess a clear explanation. I've never had that situation where I've had to deal with myself, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a lot easier getting someone dropped off. <laughs> and my consult's looking to call in. Okay, so let's end right there. Actually, Rami, I started my application and gave my biometrics in the US. Planning to go to Jordan for a few months. Is it okay to submit my passport in Jordan? Yeah, you just have to update immigration with where you're at 
um, if uh, if the passport request comes in. Okay, Rami. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I've got to jump off of here. It's been an awesome uh, another EE Live Q and A. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, remember always that this EE Live Q and A is sponsored by my Express Entry Complete Step by Step Guide to Doing It Yourself. So please, please go check it out if you're looking for guidance at just very, very nominal funds to understand the process, that's where you go. And maybe if someone's uh, tuning in here, they can post it. But I got to jump off, get on my call. All right, guys, thanks so much. Mark Holthy, Canadian Immigration Lawyer, Ex-Immigration Officer, and former high school teacher, signing off, wishing you all the best as you navigate this crazy world we call Express Entry. Take care.